Hello! So today we're going to have a look at the MD88 in Microsoft Flight Simulator. This is part of the upgrade pack from Leonardo to take the MD82 or the Mad Dog X up to the specification of the MD83 and the MD88. So outwardly I don't think there's any difference between them. I think it's to do with engine performance and um, fuel economy, that kind of thing. So it's quite an expensive upgrade for what it is, but I thought I'd do it anyway so then I could record a video and show you if there is any difference if you've been interested in looking at this but hadn't found anything online really about it. So APU section inside we're going to go and turn the batteries on so we're going to jump inside. The APU is really nice by the way. Oh I did notice when I first started the MD88 up the EFB wasn't here. I had to go into the load manager so I had to go and select the MD88 which now is listed in the variant box and then within here I could then go and enable the electronic flight bag and the reason that's really useful to have this in the aircraft if we just switch it on just wait for it to boot up is you do get a, a weight and balance calculator and a performance calculator which will give you your climb numbers so I've gone and done that previously so I've written it down on a bit of paper so we've got that to reference during our takeoff so okay let's go and run through getting this thing up and running so I'm following a printed checklist that I made some time ago I will put a link to it in the notes if I remember to later if I don't put a comment in and say where's the checklist you idiot so okay so control six let's go and turn the batteries to on so the battery switch is right in the middle of the overhead panel so you click it to pull it down and then you roll the mouse wheel on it to turn the screw on it to lock it in position in the on position then we go and turn the start pump switch to on over here then in the APU section we turn the master switch to start and then once it's been at the start for a second we go back to run and you should see this needle will start to go around all on its own there it goes so this is the auxiliary power unit powering up the, it's a small jet engine in the tail of the plane if we go and come around here you should hear it happening so you can see there's the exit port for it or exhaust port hear that engine starting Okay, so when that gets to 100%, then the APU is up and running and the light will light up here to tell us it's available and we can cross feed over the electricity generation for all of the aircraft systems to that small jet engine. There it comes. So then we can click these two buttons and things start to boot up and go crazy all over the plane. <laughs> so don't worry about it. As we go around the cockpit doing things, the various warnings will go out. Okay, so electric power switch. We've done the L bus and R bus to on, which were those up there. So then we go to prepare for flight. So what we're going to do is go to the FMC, the flight management computer, which hasn't actually booted up. Oh, here it comes. So it takes it a moment usually. So we're just using the cursor keys to move around the cockpit and the mouse, by the way. So holding the right mouse button down <coughs> and panning. So position initialization first. We're going to pick up the GNS position and drop it into the empty field. Then we're going to put in our reference airport. So Echo Golf Mike Charlie is South End, which is where we're taking off from. So this is, let's just have a quick look at that. This is the South End airport from Pilot Plus. It's really good. Okay, so we've put in our reference airport and we'll go now to this is page one of three so let's go and have a look see what else is in here yeah nothing else that concerns us for now we go to our route page where are we going to we're going to brussels and that's echo bravo bravo romeo so we drop that into the destination now we want the runway we are leaving echo golf mike charlie on which is runway two three so type in two three into the scratch pad drop that into the runway box and we're going to put a couple of waypoints in so detling d or De delta echo tango is our first waypoint 
And our next waypoint en route is Intux. This is really just to make a nice shaped route. It's just a little test flight. It's not a, a you know, not a, an official airway that we're going to be following. So then we will activate that route and execute it. We can go to performance initialization there. We can put in our cruise altitude. We'll fly at 18,000 feet or flight level 180. Fuel for the route, the, the fuel on block in this aircraft when you load into the sim is seven tons. So we'll put 7.0 in. We also have to put slash N on the end. And I forget exactly why that is, but you just have to do it. The, the takeoff weight is going to be 58.4 tons for the airframe and the fuel which then it can subtract one from the other and give you your zero fuel weight and then you can put in your reserves so how much fuel do you want left over we'll just say a ton and <clears throat> that should all be good cost index we'll put in 100 so that governs how aggressively the aircraft can climb and accelerate en route transition altitude should be correct at 6,000 feet so take off parameters we want to put the v-speeds in i've already used the calculator and i've written them down so it's 117 and 129 and 129 okay then we come back to the index page and we can go and do our departure and arrival information so we're departing on runway 23 out of south end on, on the way into brussels we are going to arrive ils on runway 01 we're not going to be using a standard approach route so we can just execute that change if we look in the legs page now you can see there's our major waypoints on the way out and then there's a discontinuity so we can close up that discontinuity just by selecting the beginning of the approach and pulling it over the discontinuity and then execute that and that then causes the airplane to calculate the various numbers on route so the only thing we really need to worry about on the way out is to be above 2000 feet at cf01 so that's on the approach into brussels the, the on route it's kind of estimating where we'll be so we're not going to worry too much about that okay so that's that program the next thing we need to worry about is the the master control panel for the autopilot so just get things in the right um getting the parameters in the right places so we turn the flight directors on we'll turn on the initial speed for the auto throttle to say 200 knots we'll turn this to the same direction as the runway so two three four degrees for the heading and again we'll be using nav mode probably along the way but we'll have a look two three four degrees um, then we set our target altitude for the flight, which will be 18,000 feet. Can we pull this? Yeah, we can. Um, and then we want to set a vertical speed. So let's go and set it at 2,000 feet per minute for the initial climb out. uh what else what haven't we done i think that's just about it it's as far as the basic setup of the master control panel goes so then press control and one to go to the co-pilot panel and we turn the anti-collision lights to oh that's the strobe sorry let's turn those back off for the moment anti-collision lights go to on Uh, we pan down and we turn on the trans and OGS switches to on down here. Airspeed indicator, we click on the V speed markers, which will then move them to the speeds that we have already configured. We can go back to the pilot side of the cockpit and uncage the standby attitude indicator now. So we pull it out and you see it start to roll around. You pull it out again and it should stabilize in the middle. There it goes. Okay, so control five takes us to the rear of the pedestal in the center of the aircraft. We switch TCAS to TARA, so that's here. We open the pneumatic crossfeed valves. So if we look down, 
we'll pull back here and open them. Then press Control 4. Adjust the flaps. So this is where this gets interesting. The the flap setting it we rec were recommended for takeoff was 23.5. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to go with flaps 15. And 12 and a half on the central gravity is correct. So flaps 15. So we need to move the flaps to the takeoff level so these have to match so then this is like a, like a mechanical calculator so given the center of gravity we have in the aircraft and the flap level that we're taking off with we need to move the vertical stabilizer to match where that calculator points to so that will put the airplane at rotate speed in a state of equilibrium okay so that's done okay so we've done that, so we go back overhead now. We turn the pumps on for the fuel tanks that have fuel, so that's all of them. We'll turn the pumps to auto. In the APU section, we turn the APU air to on now. So air goes to on. We check the pneumatic pressure down here as above four, and it is. That's all good. Whoa, this camera's moving around a bit rapidly. Um, lights at the far bottom left, no smoking to on, which it already is. Seat belts to on. Emergency lights to armed. Okay. On the co-pilot panel, we go and set the strobe lights now to position and we perform pushback. So to perform pushback in the MD-82, I'm just gonna get rid of the yoke out of the way for the moment. We push this plunger in, which frees up the, the brakes and we press shift P to cheat this in the simulator and the tractor will come out and push us back. So while that's happening, let's go and have a little look outside. So we are going to taxi around the edge of the apron and then to along taxiway alpha for runway 23. So we just wait for the pushback. In the real world, you'll be starting engines while the pushback happens. So let's just see how we do that. So control six was it. So ignition goes to both, which is here. So this is the ignition systems. Then we, sorry, we flick this down. We use the mouse wheel on it to make it stay down. And then we can see the numbers are coming up. The N2 number is increasing for engine number two. When it gets to 20, we will move the starter lever forwards for engine number two, or advance the starter lever to on. So we'll just wait for that 18, 19, 20. And engine number two is starting. Let's go and see where we are. This is where you really need two pairs of hands to do all of this all at the same time. So we're going to stop the pushback at that point. He says famous last words. Put the parking brake on. Yeah, this has gone wrong, look. We're going to get two tractors. So I'm pressing Shift-P repeatedly to get them both to go away. OK. So engine number two should be stable now, and it is. So we can flick that back shut. We can roll down the starter for engine number one. You'll see the N2 number start to increase. So that's the gas turbine being spun up by compressed air from the APU. When it gets to 20%, we will advance the starter for engine number one and get the engine up and running. So advance the starter. Exhaust gas temperature rises, turbofan starts to speed up, and we're almost there. So we just wait for that to happen. Again, in the real world, this would all have been happening simultaneously, but we've only got one pair of hands. So this is all a bit pedestrian. It's worth pointing out, you don't start the engines usually until pushback has happened or is, is in progress, because the, you know, there's gonna be people around the aircraft. Uh, 
Okay, so engines have now started. So ignition system can come off, start pump can come off, APU master can go to, or sorry, the air can go to off, master can go to off. We can turn the master caution off there. Quite often you have to disable the master caution by hand. We can see what we've got left. So pitot stall heat is off. So pitot heat is off basically. So we turn the pitot to capped. Um, above, if we go and have a quick look above before we start taxiing, we can turn off the APU cross feed up there. Um, just looking back at the checklist to make sure we don't miss anything. So we've done all of the air commands. So pitot to capped is done. Air condition supply to auto. So this is the cabin pressurization system. Uh, did we actually turn the APU off? We did, didn't we? Yeah. We are essentially ready to taxi at this point. So during the taxi, so we don't blind anybody, we go and turn the strobe lights to actually strobe at last. So we'll do it a little bit early. So you can see we immediately have some positive thrust as soon as we come off the brakes. So when both engines are operating, the plane will roll. So we're just turning towards the taxi direction. So any other things we need to be aware of on the way? We need to put the engine management system into takeoff mode. So that's over here. So we click the TO button. And we need to just have a double check on our way out to the runway that we've done everything we need to here. So we've got two, three, four degrees plus 2000 feet a minute on the vertical speed. So the, the point of doing all of this is so you don't get a surprise when you engage the autopilot. So you need the numbers here to match what you are doing before you engage the autopilot. So we'll be looking to climb out at 2000 feet a minute and to engage the auto throttle. In fact, we could increase this out to 220 just to be to give ourselves more of a window. You can also go and pre-configure your course. So we want 234, don't we? Although we're not going to actually be actively using that. So we're just going out towards. Uh, we're not using VOR radios, so we don't need really to worry about that. So let's just have a look outside and see how close we are to these other aircraft. Oh, we've got plenty of room. It's quite a tight squeeze at South End. It's a lovely airport though. I love the detailing of the the radar. I'm just going to touch the brakes, slow us down to help make these turns. There's a lot of cars in the car park, it's a busy airport. And hopefully we'll have a nice uneventful departure. I think unless you practice some of these aircraft a lot, there's always something you're going to miss. So, and again, I've done a very shortened abbreviated version of the checklist. I've not done any of the checks to make sure systems are working, but I've got failures switched off. This aircraft can do fantastic failure management or simulation of failures, I should say. And because it is such a high fidelity cockpit, everything works really nicely. So we're going to turn the nose lights on to bright. We're going to go and extend the landing lights. And we'll keep them on until we get to 10,000 feet. Okay. So we're just rolling up to the apron.
we may as well just go we're not using our traffic control obviously today so we've got not too much to worry about in terms of configuring things so full throttle it's very quiet in the cockpit isn't it it's because the engines are right at the far end of the aircraft so you can see on the display here where our first waypoint of the day is going to be so we're waiting for about 130 knots to rotate And that van timed his entrance onto the runway wonderfully, didn't he? So we're just being pushed sideways by the wind a little. Just correcting for that. This aeroplane never wants to come off the ground in a hurry. So gear up. Gear up, lights out. So auto throttle on. Flap zero. And autopilot on. And we're off to the races. So when we go to nav mode, and it should start banking left to get to the rest of the flight. So let's go and go for 2,500 feet a minute on the climb rate. It's looking good. So we're just over speeding slightly. Have I got the. I haven't put speed mode on, have I? So we're going to go for 250 knots. So flaps can come up. Slats retracted. Climb programming on the engine management system. So you can see the throttles should be moving now of their own accord. Coming up to 3,000 feet. It's pretty much pegging it, isn't it, against the, the stops at the moment. It's actually, is, has this worked? Let's go, no, it wasn't working. So we've slightly oversped there. I had not noticed we hadn't gone into speed mode. So I've now corrected that. So to expedite that deceleration, I'm going to throw the spoilers out just to bring the indicated airspeed down to 250. And there we go. We're at 250 now. The engines are coming back up to speed to get to 250 again. We're coming through 5,000 feet. So in another 1,000 feet, we will go and calibrate the... Actually, it looks like we're at 2992 already. So I didn't set that, did I, during the config? What was the, um, it was 2968, so it wasn't so far away. So we come through 6,000 feet, which is the point we would have gone to 2992 anyway. So our next decision point is 10,000 feet, <coughs> where we, we can already turn off the nose lights, but mm, that's interesting, they're connected. We want the landing lights on until we get to 10,000 feet, ideally. But we don't want the nose light on, obviously, because the nose has been retracted. Or so the landing gear has been retracted. But we don't get a, there isn't a light under the nose, is there? No. God, look at the rubbish this thing pumps out of the back. We see a dirty brown cloud behind us, and it's very noisy. Okay, eight and a half thousand feet coming up. We're looking good. So it says VOR fail down here because we're not using the um, no, radios. We haven't even got them tuned in. So we could have a play and on our flight plan go and dial in, say, the Dover 11495 maybe. So if we go 114... Nine five, just to see the symbology change. There we go. So the, you can see the nav radio is counting down there alongside the the GPS system, which is quite cool. So we've just gone through ten thousand feet. So flaps can come up. 
sorry not flaps the uh, <laughs> the lights can go out and we can increase speed now out to cruise speed and we can we're still climbing but we can look for 320 knots at least or you would if you could control the master control panel in a sensible manner so if you look on terms of our route we're on our way it's interesting that the aeroplane didn't navigate the turn very well. It overshot the turn, didn't come out of the turn fast enough. The roll rate is remarkably slow on the MD-80 family of aircraft. I think we should. Hmm. You can't get rid of the EFB, you'd have to do it through the load manager, I guess. Which we can do. So if we go and do this and then say sync, and then look inside, then the EFB will have disappeared. So you get a much more authentic late 80s version, or mid 90s I guess for this aircraft, early 90s. Much more authentic flight deck before we had flat screen tablets everywhere doing everything. So you can see all the panels have, have um, gone out, so there's no warnings. Nothing to be aware of. All of the panel here, it looks good. So we're within parameters, we're still in climb mode coming up towards cruise so once we get to 18,000 feet it's hardly worth turning the seat belts off is it so we're just coming up in the next 10 miles to top of climb so 15,000 feet at almost at 320 knots And on our way across the channel to first France, then into Belgium. And we are maintaining two and a half thousand feet a minute very nicely. just make sure by pulling this knob that this is actually armed on the altitude so it says alt cap and now we're within 900 feet of it it's lit up to tell us it's going to stop the climb basically so you'll see that the vertical speed is winding off now so we can go to cruise mode on the engines and the throttles will come back appropriately so broadly speaking I mean I haven't flown this aeroplane for a while so I'm a little bit rusty so I've made odd little bits of mistakes here and there but it hasn't changed a great deal inside the cockpit it's just to do with performance parameters I think of the different power plants that the MD 88 had versus the 83 or the 82 so it'd be interesting to get some feedback from real pilots that have looked at this add-on to see what their recollections are of the difference between the different models and how it impacted them operationally so let's go and increase the range on this display so we can actually see where we're going Okay, so 18,000 feet, 320 knots, it's all looking good. So until we get to top of descent, which will be probably 15 minutes away, I'm going to pause recording so you don't get bored out of your mind waiting for it. So see you in a moment. Okay, so we're back in the aircraft and you can see we have some pretty severe wedding, weather ahead of us, which I had not been banking on. So should make approach and landing a bit more eventful which is good because that means we have something to deal with okay so we're going to initially come down to you can see on the chart we're not quite at top of descent yet but we're going to come down early so we get more time to think on the way so let's come down to 10,000 feet to begin with so we'll arm the um, altitude 
for 10,000 and we set the v-speed to come down at say a thousand feet a minute so you can see the throttles are reacting a little bit too slowly to that happening and this is the danger of using vertical speed yeah you can get into trouble in a big hurry So you need to keep an eye on indicated airspeed whenever you're using vertical speed. So we're coming down towards 10,000 feet a minute. We can actually see that happening on the plot on Little Nav Map. So you can see if you're ahead or behind of where you would like to be. So if we came down a bit steeper, say 1,500 feet a minute, you have to be aware, and this is where you start looking at the pilot operating handbook, of what descent rates you can get away with in a given aircraft without using spoilers to, to increase your descent rate. Apologise if you hear voices in the background. Three daughters are in the house to, to today and they're being quite vocal, let's put it that way. So let's push this on to see if we can maintain the same speed we wanted at 1800 feet a minute. So keep an eye on the indicated airspeed, keep an eye on where the throttles have retarded to. And keep an eye on this bank of cloud we're about to go and fall into. This is going to be interesting, isn't it? So again, instrument approach. This is why we practice these things. So let's go and look at the weather at Brussels just to get some idea. So if we can hover over it actually to find out. So when we hover over in this one map, it gives us quite a, a few clouds at 4,000 feet, 3,000 feet, so broken at 1100 so there's cloud all over the place basically <laughs> scattered at 700 feet oh my word it's going to be fun there's going to be cloud all the way down until the last couple of thousand feet or thousand feet even so let's find out what the airfield elevation is as well so we're going to arm ourselves with as much information as possible on the way in so show information for brussels elevations 175 feet so we want to be about at the entrance into the ils feathers after we make our turn at cf01 ideally we want to be at 2700 feet at that point so it's saying above 2000 but ideally about 2700 if that's is that a three degree yes a three degree glide slope so let's go and program the nav radio as well for the ILS. So we want 109.9 degrees. Oh, sorry, 109.9 .9 on the frequency. And 13 degrees magnetic on the course. So 109.9. And 13 degrees. Uh, it doesn't matter with the opposite side of the compass. There isn't a quicker way. So we've now pre-programmed the the course and the ILS. We'll do both sides actually, nav one and nav two. So 109.9 and to 13 degrees. Hey, how are we doing on the height? Coming down to 10,000 feet. I don't think I'd armed it. I have now. <laughs> so we'll also look to be slowing down then to 250 knots now. We're not going to have much to go on for the rest of this flight. So let's go and put the spoilers out to bring the speed down. 
before we dip below 10,000 feet. So let's have a see where we are on the route. We're just approaching Intux. Is it called Intux? Yes, Intux. So we want to be coming down once we get to 250 knots, which we have just achieved. We can raise the spoilers again and we can go. OK, let's go down to 2000 or 3000 feet will do. We should pick up the ILS from that height and we'll come down at a rate of. And we can use the range on this to see this, to estimate it. Actually, we've changed the mode on this, haven't we? I'm not happy with that. There we go, that's better. So if we come down at... ...1800 hundred feet a minute again. So there's the green banana that tells us... We, ...now we need to get down by CF01 to our target altitude so we don't need to be coming down at quite this pace so let's increase the range on this again so yeah you can see now when we make the turn at CF01 we need to be at 2700 so if we're at 3000 at this point that's all good the glide slope fail that will all go away when we get within range I've clicked on this again haven't I that will all go away once we get within range of the radio and it will all be good famous last words shall we start slowing down give the airplane actually some time to slow down so we'll slow down to 200 knots so we can do everything with plenty of time so we're not in a rush so you can see there's a little bit of ice forming on the windows from these clouds so we're going to go and turn on ice prevention systems if i can find them uh, da, 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 da. air conditioning anti-ice here we go windshield anti-ice on anti-fog no we don't need that and an, an engine protection from ice and the airfoil ice protection on and we're good So the ice that was forming should not get any worse. In fact, it should go away. This is a really, really great flight to be doing. So we're coming down below 10,000 feet now, obviously. So we should have had the landing lights out already. So we're down to 6,000 feet already. So remember, I think it's 5,000 feet across much of Europe. We need to get the, it would be on the chart, but we need to get the um, barometric pressure for the destination airfield. So on Brussels, whether the uh, 2971 or 1006, so 1006, is this synchronized? Yes, it is. And this one is not. Okay. So then we've got the accurate reference to the ground, knowing that the ground is about 200 and something feet. 220, was it? Something like that. Okay, so we're making the turn. We'll pull the zoom in on this so we get to see the screen a bit more accurately. We're going too fast. So I've thrown the spoilers out, which will hopefully slow us down. Famous last words. So although we went for a target airspeed, we didn't adjust our vertical speed. Which we will do now. Because we've got plenty of extra room to do so, and the speed is coming off, which is good. And we'll be looking to drop the wheels and get onto the... We can see the, the localizer now and the glide slope have appeared, which is all good. 
So everything is coming towards us. So we're coming down towards 3,000 feet. There's the runway. So we're going to make the final turn towards final approach. You can see the symbology is slowly changing as we get closer. So this final bit of speed should bleed off once we level out at 3000, which is about to happen. So I'm going to get my cup of coffee out of the way. I'm going to get the throttle to hand and the joystick to hand so I can easily control this on approach. And we are going to have some fun. So auto throttle, off. Autopilot, off. I'm not entirely sure how you cancel these. Somebody did tell me a while ago, and I can't remember for the life of me now, how you do that. Okay, so I'm going to take the, the bull by the horns. We're going to maintain 3,000 feet for the moment, lose some speed. We're just dropping a little bit, so I'm going to trim us back out as we lose speed. So, gear down. Gear down. So we've gone long. we've gone a little bit off to the side so we're just correcting it's quite nice that we've got the ground in view over there but we've gone a little bit off to the right so we're going to go and cross back across the runway so we're looking at the vertical position now we're going to get the nose back up start putting some flaps in slats extended Okay, so here comes the, the ILS, sorry, the glide slope, I should say. Flaps 15. So we're still Flaps off to 20. the left we're high the trim is way out so we're there, getting there or thereabouts on the speed just need to get the ILS lined up so let's see if we can pull the Zoom in on this a little bit. So that's the markers that we've just gone through. So let's start descending a little bit to get the, the glide slope. So there's the center line has just swept through. And there's the runway directly in front of us. So we're still high, but it's better to be high in these sort of situations than too low. Five 
Flaps four. Three hundred. Two hundred. Sink rate. Sink rate. Sink rate. Sink rate. One hundred. Thirty. Twenty. Ten. So that was very, very unconventional on the approach. Really should have done a go around, but I didn't want to record a, another 20 minutes. So, there you go. It's interesting that so many things came together so quickly. So it just shows you, it's practice, 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 especially for extreme conditions. 60 knots. So we obviously brought that in manually. But in the real world, you might have gone around to get everything prepared in a lot more, a lot more in advance rather than diving, you know, for the runway. The um, automated systems are having an absolute nightmare, aren't they? So anyway, there's obviously various bits and pieces. Yeah, it's saying abnormal air <laughs> icing conditions. Um, so we can go and turn off the icing commands now. And go and park up. I'm not sure how we cancel some of these alarms. It's almost like something's gone wrong. Okay, so obviously yes, the most unconventional landing I've done in quite some time. In the real world you would have done a go around there because we just weren't prepared. So we, we threw it at the ground basically in the end with spoilers out, flaps down. And yes, we made a smooth landing, but it was completely unconventional and quite dangerous. And I have no idea how to shut up the the flight management system, which is having an absolute fit with me. But in a strange sort of way, this flight was a really good example of saturation and the human limits of being able to do too many things at once and really should have called it should have gone round but i didn't so obviously in a simulator you can get away with all sorts of things but in the real in the real aircraft that wouldn't have happened you know in the real world you would have gone around because we were not prepared for the situation we found ourselves in we were kind of winging it and that just doesn't happen in the real world anyway i'm going to leave it there We'll just go and turn off some of those lights. So the landing lights can come off. The nose light can go back off. The strobes can go off. Anti-collision lights can come off now. And we would have normally, under normal circumstances, started the APU up as well on the way in. We haven't done that. Uh, but anyway, I'm going to leave it there. So this is really to take a look at the MD-88. And I'm really impressed with it. There's obviously huge chunks of this I don't know enough about, like how to stop this alarm from going bananas. Okay, all I had to do was go and, <laughs> go and press the altitude switch. But, um, yeah, there's obviously huge parts of this that I don't know enough about to operate it confidently. I know kind of enough to get by. And that's, as you saw, in extreme conditions, that is not enough. So... An interesting one and we will come back to this aeroplane and we'll look at some extreme situations on purpose and how you deal with them and you don't rush in like we did today okay anyway see you again soon <laughs>